Evening all, thank you for coming um, and sort of giving us your valuable time tonight. And I'd like to hand over to uh, Thomas Robson Carnu to give uh, his life story and amazing and inspiring story that he's got to tell. <laughs> so over to you, Thomas, for the next half an hour or so. Thank you, Narinda. Um, no, massive thank you. Thank you very, very much. No, a pleasure to be here. It's always nice, obviously, having these, uh, you know, sort of bespoke and opportunities to share, obviously, my personal story, um, you know, with a group of people, which, you know, I think we've got lo lots of commonalities in. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, the time of the year as well being October, um, I think it's really important that we share journeys and stories of, you know, hopefully um, inspiration and, you um, you know, challenges that we've all faced and come through. So, yeah, my personal journey, um, I was fortunate enough to uh, have played in the Premier League. So I didn't manage to win the Barclays Premier League uh, trophy up there, but um, I certainly played in, in, in the league of players who, who did win it. So uh, as a professional footballer, uh, obviously had uh, a f the privilege of having a career at the highest level of the game. Um, for those who don't know me, I've obviously played internationally for Wales and also for West Bromwich Albion and for Reading Football Club. Um, and I played a career at the highest level for over 15 years. But to actually get there, um, I had to come through quite some severe adversity. So I suffered two major surgeries as a teenager on my knee um, after rupturing my cruciate knee ligament. And uh, coming back from those surgeries, I had to basically reduced the inflammation and pain in my knee and uh, unfortunately at the time the club doctors and the physios they prescribed me anti-inflammatories and painkillers which are really you know common drugs and medications for reducing pain and inflammation but unfortunately my body had a complete adverse reaction to them so I started passing blood of my urine had severe nausea and this was after two and a half years of you know surgeries um, on my knee so it was a really traumatic period and at the time, uh, my father and I, we basically turned to natural nutrition to uh, support my recovery. Um, and we began researching natural ingredients that reduced pain and ultimately inflammation. Um, and we began seeing different cultures around the world, uh, different practices, so things such as Ayurvedic. Uh, practices, things such as um, ancient Asian co uh, cultures, what raw ingredients they would use to support their health and ultimately reduce pain and reduce inflammation. And these ingredients consist of things like watermelon, things like pomegranate, pineapple, ginger and subsequently turmeric. But it was all about having it in its rawest format, which is obviously the root or the raw flesh, um, but also having it in a bioavailable form. So, you know, not a capsule or a tablet or powder, it was about having it in its rawest format and in a form which is easily absorbable. So adding it with a black pepper mix, adding it with a fat soluble to enhance the bioavailability of the active compounds. And um, my dad basically sourced these raw ingredients, turned them into what initially was a paste and then became this golden elixir um, and I began using it and it was my only real opportunity of recovery so I just stuck with it. Um, and two, three weeks in, began noticing a little less restriction in my knee. It would normally take me about 15 minutes coming out of bed just to get the range into my knee again. Um, but it was around six weeks of using this blend every single day. And my dad would make these batches every few days and leave them in my fridge. That I woke up my usual routine, roll out of bed into the bathroom and into the shower. And it was in the shower at that moment in time that I realised that was the first time in over two and a half years that I had woken up without any pain or restriction in my knee. So for me, it was a massive light bulb moment because up until that point, the doctors and the physios and the surgeons had all said that, you know, I would always experience pain or inflammation um, and that the way to remedy it was to take medication. And so I ultimately defied the odds, uh, odds in terms of recovery by um, you know, this blend that my father created. And so from that point on, um, I went on a year later to make my debut for Reading Football Club. Um, a year after that, I went on to play uh, internationally for Wales. And a year after that, I made my um, Premier League debut um, when we got promoted with Reading Football Club to the Premier League. And I was able to do all of that pain-free. 
Um, and I used this blend throughout my whole career, ultimately as my secret weapon. So I began realizing that, you know, I would recover quicker than my teammates. You know, I'd get to the uh, flu season, which we're all coming into now, and you know, I'd never get run down, would never get a cold, um, and realized that there was other benefits to actually consuming this blend. And so we began prescribing it to friends and family, um, to teammates, you know, my auntie who had real severe arthritis in her hands, um, you know, couldn't hold a pen after a few weeks of using it, could write again, uncle, real bad back pain, chronic back pain, six weeks of using it, again, was pain free. So we realized that this was a real unique homemade recipe um, and remedy. And so it was in 2016 when I was in Harrods um, and I saw a turmeric shot on the shelf. And, you know, really excited because up until this point, my father had ruined dozens upon dozens of blenders. You know, he'd go to his work with stained fingertips. Every utensil in the kitchen, you know, was pretty much stained yellow. Um, so to see a turmeric shot on the shelf was, you know, amazing to see. So I bought a load of them, went back to my dad's and we went to drink it together and we literally spat it out. We couldn't believe how inferior it was to what we were creating at home. And it was only when we spun the bottle and looked at the ingredients that we realized that the base of this shot, which was sitting on the shelf, was apple juice and water. And the turmeric was turmeric powder, you know, not the raw root. And there was no other functional ingredients in this functional shot. So we realized that there was a massive gap in the market between what was currently on shelf and actually products delivering a functional benefit. And we realized that what we had as a homemade recipe could do that. So uh, we set about bringing this product and this blend to market. Um, and we went on a two year journey. Uh, we went and spoke with the leading beverage manufacturers in the UK and in Europe. Um, they all laughed us out of their door because they said you'll never be able to manufacture that product because the quality of the ingredients is too high and the process is too complex. So we basically became a manufacturer of uh, functional turmeric based shots ourselves. Um, we set up a facility um, and two years after making the decision, we launched uh, the Turmeric Co as a brand. And what we realized was rather than immediately sitting on shelf, we really needed to uh, build a brand, build an advocacy, build a community. Um, so the way that we did that was by going direct to consumer. We built a really strong um, online model. We built a social audience through experience and book aimed to build a real advocacy around what we were doing in our ethos and values of a high quality, truly functional and now clinically backed product. And so what we then did was launch a digitally native vertical brand through the Turmeric Co. Launched that in 2018 and within four weeks of our first sale, we began receiving um, customer testimonials, exactly the same experience of what I had experienced, you know, real life changing. Um, uh, testimonials and yeah the, that was in 2018 we launched we grew relatively quickly uh, we hit capacity at our previous manufacturing site um, in 2020 um, we then went on an 18-month journey of upscaling our manufacturer um, we were producing around 30,000 shots a week at that moment in time and we were like, how, how, what step change do we want to make? Do we want to go to 50,000 shots? Do we want to be able to produce 75,000 shots? Um, but we believed in the product, obviously, um, but we also wanted to offer you know, exponential growth opportunities for the business. So we um, moved to a new site in Cambridgeshire, uh, which allows us to produce 1.5 million shots a week. Um, so setting that up took about two years, uh, massive investment, massive, you know, operational output, you know, we're BRC, um, global standard, so brand reputational compliance, global standard manufacturer. Uh, we just had our audit a couple of months ago and we passed that with the AA. So it's the highest level of food manufacturer you can get globally. So, you know, we've really invested in what we do and, um, since launched in 2018, we've now had over 10,000 life-changing customer testimonials. We've impacted um, over 100,000 people uh, through our online website in the UK. Um, and we are launching into Sainsbury's tomorrow, uh, which is a massive achievement. And we are uh, looking to take the brand international over the next few years. So 
that's my um, journey of why I'm here today. And obviously, you know, really pleased that I could share that with you. Is it me? Yes. <laughs> hey, well, that was amazing. So, um, so I thought we were going to talk about something completely different. And being a banker, I suddenly learned a whole load of new, new stuff that I didn't think I should, did, was, was that, would ever have heard. That's fantastic. And I think launching into Sainsbury's is, is a huge deal, right? Mm. Because breaking into any chain like that is massive. Mm. So, and, and that's a very different journey, I suspect, to most footballers so, or ex-footballers. So I thought we'd go back a little bit because I can tell there are going to be questions there. So I can do all the questions and I will talk for England. So you need to get some questions ready and David's going to come to you. But if I take you back, just I want to get, the, get them to know you a little bit. So can we just do a couple of, just tell me what you think, top of your head. Mm -hmm. So if you were, I'd say, if you could have a single superpower, what would it be? Um, I would say the power of healing. The power of healing, yeah, yeah, yeah. that would be quite cool. And, um, but uh, yeah, any superpower, I think it would be quite cool to be able to fly. I think that would be quite a cool super superpower. Yeah. Non-invasive. Yeah. You know, it's not like going, being being able to go uh, invisible or any of these other ones. I think flying is quite a cool thing. Okay. And if you were stranded on a desert island, what's the one thing you would take? Um, the one thing that I would take uh, would be a book and just read it multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Listen, brilliant. So. You touched a little bit about your career pre becoming a, a genuine businessman. So I just want to touch a little bit the beginning, childhood. What were the kind of defining moments for you? What? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, as a child, I was you know real, really passionate about becoming a professional footballer. You know, I always knew that that was what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I can remember even being four or five carrying a ball around with me all of the time. Um, I joined Arsenal as a schoolboy at ten, um, which was you know a real transformative experience because going into professional the professional game at such a big club as a schoolboy, you sort of see the level of standards that are required. Um, so I think that was quite formative because I realised that if you want to achieve anything, um, you know, you have to really give your best. And I think a lot of people strive for perfection, um, but actually it's about, you know, impeccability. Like, can you be impeccable with your actions, um, you know, on a daily basis? And I think when you look at successful people and people who genuinely achieve something and achieving something is, you know, Come, you know, starting a role and you know promotion in a role like how, when you when you begin to deliver and achieve any level of success, you are applying yourself outside of the norm. You know, you're going above and beyond. And I think the more that you do that and you have that as your standard, like ultimately the 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 higher um, you know the higher amount of things you're going to achieve. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to ask, just following on from that, so what were the key lessons? And I think you covered that. So it would be really interesting, I guess, to understand, because the journey of most professional footballers is there are ups and there are downs, right? There are highs and there are lows. So you talked about taking experience and moving. So how did you learn to cope with that? Because I guess that's going to set you up for where you are now. Yeah, so I think it's um, ultimately, I think, what you... Sport is um, so demanding, you know, it's like, um, you know, some people will go into a meeting and it will be like, you know, I don't really want to go into this meeting today, you know, at work and there's, you know, work to be done, etc. But in football, you know, you're going every time you step out onto that pitch, you're in front of millions of people, you know, and you're getting judged and you're, you, there's an opinion of millions of people around the world on your performance, yeah. you know, and I think when you when you have that level of intensity in terms of, you know, uh, the, the attention on you and your performance and that element of being judged constantly, because that's what sport is, you know, it's, it's survival of the fittest, winner and loser, you know, it's, it's quite black and white. Um, you begin to realise that you can actually con you, how powerful your mind is, yeah. you know, so the way that you approach um, games, events, your performance, um, outcomes is everything, yeah. 
you know, it's like, so if you can program your mind into a positive state, um, you can begin to influence the event before it's happened. You know, and this is like, you know, a lot of what it boils down to is, you know, again, there's a lot of developing areas around sort of epigenetics around, you know, how you can influence your, you know, cell makeup, etc. all of this sort of stuff. But actually, it, it's fundamentally about manifestation. And I think manifestation isn't really spoken about too openly because it's, you know, how do you define it? Mm. But it's like, you know, I manifested my career, yeah. you know, because I was so passionate about it. I wanted it and I truly lived in that moment before I experienced it. And so to your point is you begin to realize that all is mind and how powerful your mind actually is. So that's like the biggest learning. And, and, and did you learn that or is that something that was just intuitive and inherent? Because you strike me as quite a spiritual person. Um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's a combination of just being open, you know, being open to information. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people, um, whatever walk of life they're in, whatever role they're doing, you know, they get conditioned and programmed. And then anything new or any new information that comes to them, they're not open to that. Yeah. You know, so I think the more open you are and something which is very uncomfortable in life general, generally is change. You know, everyone wants the same ha pattern, the same, you know, habit and consistency, but actually the biggest thing in life is change. So the better you are accepting change, the more adaptable and the better your life will actually become because you're not holding on to the past and you're open to the unknown and opportunities. And so, yeah, I think it's just, you know, just being open to opportunities. And look, that, that's, uh, that's going to resonate with loads, right? Given the last few years, all sorts going mm. on. So we've all had to learn to become more adaptable, mm. more agile in our thinking. So just thinking about how you transitioned from being a really successful footballer, um, Welsh international, um, could play for Nigeria as well. Right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I just got my Nigerian passport, oh, which I'm proud oh, about. Yeah, yeah. That's so. what I like to hear. <laughs> I always think I could have played for Nigeria, but never quite made it. Um, so transitioning from a really successful sportsman into the world of business, very different. I guess I, we were talking up there earlier, and I think there's some real synergies between the corporate world and the football world, especially in terms of, um, as we're talking about Black History Month, as, as you see real diversity, probably not at the most senior levels, and that's, no, that's not dissimilar to the corporate world. Mm. So it'd be interesting to hear how you transition from being a successful footballer into a world that was pretty unknown, albeit you were clearly doing lots of great stuff with your dad in the background. So, so how was that transition and what, what sort of obstacles did you see? Yeah, I think that's a you know, really valid point. I think um, obviously, as I said, when we launched the business, we went direct to consumer. So we were D to C brand. And even you know, up until last week before we had our first retail order, you know, we 98% of our revenues was direct to consumer. Yeah. Now, retail as an example, when you go into Sainsbury's or Asda or Tesco, more than 99.5% of the brands and products that you pick up are um, owned by non-ethnic minority groups. So when you begin to put that into perspective, you know, so for us as a black owned, you know, ethnic minority owned business, we're stepping into retail. We're, we're beginning to affect positive change in terms of diversity, you know, and driving that inclusivity, as you said, at the higher levels, the higher echelons of, you know, ownership and, you know, directors and CEO, whatever you want to call it. So I would say understanding things like that is really mind blowing because you're like, how is that even possible? You know, it's like the, you know, 50% of the foods on, 90% of the foods on shelf come from, <laughs> you know, different parts of the world. And yet, how can that be? So, yeah, I think there are definitely challenges in terms of, um, you know, how you begin to shape, um, uh, evolve the hierarchies yeah. of society. You know, I think that's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. And, and look, I think there are loads of people kind of sitting in the audience who I suspect would say, OK, so what would be that? What would be the gem you would give me in terms of 
how I look to overcome that. Because you know what you're walking into. You know you're different. And actually, that difference is your superpower. Because you're not only different, you've, bro you've broken into Sainsbury's. That's massive. Mm. So, so what would you say to some of the young, the young, well, maybe not even young, old entrepreneurs that are looking to, to do something different, but looking up and thinking, this is a tough gig? Yeah, I would say, you know, I'd go back to what I said before, like, you know, all is mind truly. So it's like if you have an opportunity or if you want to do something or you want to create something like the the only limiting factor now, you know, obviously historically, like there's there's a lot of, um, you know, history in terms of all of our past. But now it is all mind. So if you truly want to make a change and you want to achieve something which maybe hasn't been done before or is very hard to do, like a lot of the time now, and remember there's only ever the present, yeah. a lot of the time now <clears throat> it's simply your decision. You know, and, a lot, and so when it comes down to it, what actually happens for the person or for the individual at that level is they end up talking themselves out of it. They end up saying, this hasn't been done before. This can't be done. You know, this wasn't done in the past. It's not meant to be in the, you know, so actually if you just say, look, like this is, this is what I want. This is what I, what I want to achieve. And the thing is, is actually you can see that as reality because look at the change which has taken place over the last few decades. You know, we spoke about it, you know, before, uh, you know, the, when, when first coming into, you know, the roles that, you know, we had that discussion, um, you know, 20 years ago coming into a company like Barclays, you know, at very, very uh, set levels, it was, you know, there wasn't massive, yeah. you know, uh, diversity and in, in, inclusivity, whereas that's beginning to change. And so it's the next step and the next layer. So, yeah, I think um, it's all possible and, and positive change is happening. And, and do you know what? I love that. So there are a couple of things in there for me. So and get ready with your questions. Otherwise, we're just going to carry on wrapping. So, <laughs> so um, be the change you want to see. Mm -hmm. Right. So be the change you want to see. And I really so sorry, I should have said I co-chair the Black Professional Forum at Barclays. And actually, when I think about even an event like this, this wouldn't have happened three years ago, let alone 20. So there is change. Personally, it needs to be faster, swifter, mm -hmm. quicker. I'm all about that. But I think you're absolutely right. One, be the change you want to see, but equally understand that we're moving. And I think sometimes it's difficult to feel that if you don't see it. Mm. Right. Questions from the floor. David, you're running this. A uh, quick question for me. Um, you know, it takes someone special to become a professional football player. But it takes someone, you know, and then to start your own business as well. Where does that drive? you know, hunger and, um, you know, what's your purpose? Where, where does that come from? Yeah, I, th I think, um, I think everyone has, you know, their, their unique ability and that, that innate sense of self. And I think finding that for you will give you your own inspiration. I think when you look at society, everyone is always looking outside of you. You know, you're looking outside, you know, what someone else has, what they're doing, you know, what I, you know, wish to be, you know, what I, and ultimately it's about, you then think what you don't have, you know, so it's like, if you truly go inside of yourself, you know, really, you know, know yourself, know thyself, you know, there's a lot of, you know, information, information is already out there, you know, it's all, it's all there. I think, um, you know, you, you can, you can really find your own purpose and every single per person's purpose is completely different. You know, so I'd say, where does my drive or passion come from? It comes from n feeling, you know, at one with myself, you know, and then that allows me to, you know, to do things and, you know, have a level of intensity, a level of focus, a level of drive, a level of inspiration, which maybe isn't the norm, you know, but that's my norm, you know, so, and you can create a norm as, you know, 10 times more special if you, you know, if that's your, your norm, you know, so it's like, I think, um, yeah, just um, living in, you know, just living in the gain rather than like living in the gap. Like a lot of people just always, you know, there's like so many opportunities, you know, it's like we're, look at this amazing stage we're in, you know, we're sitting on, you know, 10 years ago, they weren't cushions, they were, you know, <laughs> but like there's so many amazing gains and opportunities and, 
you know, things that we can all be grateful for and, you know, reprogram our minds to think in that state. And ultimately, as I said, a lot of what we experience is ultimately down to what, what we, you know, what, what we're creating, you know. So, yeah, so create, you know, be a creator. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Sense of purpose, mm. which is going to be different for everybody, right? Mm. So, so, yeah, love that. Right, more questions. I've got, I've got a question. So, you've been a professional footballer, you're now a professional entrepreneur. Mm. Um, I'm big into manifestation and gratitude and everything like that, and I believe you can manifest anything. What's the next biggest thing for you that you want to manifest, if you're allowed to say? Yeah, no, I think it's just like, as I, as I said, like back to David's point, like just maintaining my own, you know, sense of self, like just being at one with myself. You know, I think that's the biggest thing. Like I've had, you know, I played in the Premier League, I've, you know, gone shoulder to shoulder, walked out of tunnels with Ronaldo and, you know, played against Met. Like all, it's, it's brilliant, right? It's amazing. Like what an amazing privilege. And so with that privilege comes lots of opportunities and lots of things that are, you know, um, nice, you know, m in the material world, you know, whether it's wealth, um, adulation, like whatever it is, but actually what you realise, like regardless of everyone here would always, you know, it's easy to say and look over there and be like, oh, you know, if only I had that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if only, you know, if I'm earning 50K, oh, if only I was earning 70K, you know, like, what, like it's like, well, hold on. It's like, actually, when you come out of that and actually really truly realize that regardless of what we have in the material world it's all irrelevant you know because you know at some point you know it comes and it goes and so actually the most important person in your world is you you know so make sure that you are inspired you know you are you know you have love you know around you you know you give and i think that living in that state is the most powerful thing so for me it's doing the work to be in that state as much as possible and it's not easy you know everyone has challenges and you know late for work bills you know like all of these things that you that are there to distract you away from being at one with yourself so I think doing the work to really sit with yourself is quite quite cool so I love that yeah, I've walked out with Ronaldo and Messi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got on the Northern Line. Yeah. Anyway, let's keep going. Right, more, more questions. It's just following on from that bit there yeah. about football. In the Euros, two, Euros 2009, 2016, when you turned back on the plane with all the players landing in Wales, what was it like? Mm. Well, I, was, I remember seeing it on TV and you know, the fans were going crazy. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was nuts. I think, yeah, there was like a million people on the streets. It was crazy, <laughs> like the whole of, uh, whole of Wales. So no, it was, um, it, it was a massive privilege. Like it was just, you know, um, I think um, as a sports person, you know, you, you have a lot of privileges and, you know, you have, um, you know, you're idolised by you know, kids and adults and you know older you know you know, idolized by everyone who's a fan of that team so um to have experienced that it was just yeah as i said like a really unique experience but that was you know 10 years of you know from an international perspective of that togetherness of that particular group you know and so um you know like you said before it's like of course you know things take time right so that was a real journey for wales as a nation we went from being ranked 134 third in the world to being ranked I think our highest ranking at that point in time was sixth or seventh you know so we were like ranked higher than England at one point and all of this stuff and it was you know it was a real unique time so yeah I think um, it shows what what is possible um, and yeah I think just as I said um, you know, living in the moment and being grateful. And for me now, it's like, yeah, that I've achieved that. And so I have a massive amount of gratitude for experiencing that, um, you know, but I'm, I'm not attached to that, if that makes sense. Because, you know, whereas a lot of, and you see it as well in a lot of, um, particularly athletes and footballers in particular, because you're adored, mm. you know, you walk into a room, you know, after that um, uh, Euro 2016, you know, if I went out in Wales on the street, you know, you're getting mobbed, you know, it's like if I went into a restaurant, the, the bill would be paid, you know, and it's like, but then you'd be mobbed walking out and it's like, it, it was a, 
you know, in, <laughs> it's easy to get ego involved in that and then attach with that. And I think when you step outside of that, it's like, well, that was amazing, but that's not me. It was an experience that I got to experience. So I think really having that mindset has allowed me to, you know, really so, progress. So it always intrigues me. So how do you cope with that? Because it's not how you were brought up, right? So suddenly to walk into a restaurant and somebody wants to pay the bill and you're not going to be able to sit down without people wanting you to sign something and you've got to, you've got, you're always on, right? You're always on, you're always working. Mm. How, how do you mentally cope with that? Yeah, I think, and that's the thing that I go back to is like, you realise like it is all mine because that can easily like wear and drain you at the same time as it can create a full sense of ego as well because then you attach to that ego of the person who's having that adulation. But, you know, just because, you know, I find it fascinating just because someone's an elite footballer and playing at the highest level and this is what idolization is. Mm -hmm. You know, you, people don't realize that you're still human. <laughs> you know, it's like, if, like, like we said, like, it's like Ronaldo, Messi, like a lot of people, it's hard to, real, it's hard to comprehend that these guys are just, just regular people. Just regular people. So um, I think, yeah, just being sort of conscious of that and the fact that, as I said, you know, it's, it's about appreciating the moment but actually, you know, not, not trying to hold on to it at the same time. Yeah, it, I love that, holding on to the, holding on to the you, right? Mm. No matter what, and that level of humility always serves well. So, right, more questions. Have we probably overrun? Is anyone keeping any time? Because I'm not. I've got a question. <laughs> um, has there been anything that surprised you on your entrepreneurial journey? Oh, surprise. Um, yeah, lots of things. <laughs> like, every day there's a surprise. Um, I think it's... Um, yeah, I think uh, lo lots of surprises. Uh, it, it, lots of surprises, lots of challenges, but the way that I approach them is that they're just opportunities. Like genuinely, like, you know, someone walks in, you know, you've got a real great star player in your team, you know, and it might be in the sales team, it might be in the ops team, you know, and the day, day later they decide to leave, you know, for whatever reason, you know that is actually an opportunity because it's creating a gap, it's creating a void, you know, for something to be filled. And if you're, you know, negative and you don't see the opportunity, you actually close that, you know, the void and you don't opportunity, you don't allow the opportunity for that to be filled with potentially something better, you know? So I think, um, has anything surprised me? Yeah, just, just nuts. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, everything. Yeah, it's, it's everything, but I think, um, you know, the, the biggest learning I think I've had is that everyone is, um, that businesses are fundamentally made, of, made up of people. And I think when you, particularly in corporate um, businesses as well, it's easy to just look at the numbers. You know, it's a numbers game in terms of staff count, you know, revenue, blah, blah, blah. But what, I've, what I truly believe is like, and what I truly know is that it is, any organization is made up of the people. And you know, you look at Barclays, like Barclays is genuinely only here because of the people in this room. And the difference is, is that there are, you know, probably another 10,000, you know, groups of the you people for Barclays who will support and, you know, give your best and, you know, be impeccable with your actions for the, for the organization. And that's what makes a company. And I think, um, really understanding that and then how you can then influence that for the better to create a successful organization is like a real um, unique ability for businesses. That's why I always say there's so much similarity between elite sports and team sports and organizations. Yeah. Uh, high performing teams, everybody knows their place, everybody knows their role, clear succession, you're not always going to work as a single functional team, but it's mm -hmm. about how you how you acknowledge that and work through that. So, so many similarities. I'm I'm sure we're horribly over, but I don't really care. So let's keep going. Thank you for such an honest, open conversation. Um, you you've spoken a lot about mindset. I just wanted to ask you, from being a footballer to starting an entrepreneurial journey, is no, it's not easy for anyone to go into business. What skills did you draw upon, or you know, what were your main challenges when you went into being an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think um, 
the biggest thing of what I took from being a footballer to being an entrepreneur was the, you know, the attention to detail and the willingness to persevere. Um, you know, and that's why a lot of people ask me, what's the, you know, what's the most important bit of advice that you would give to another entrepreneur? Um, and I would say like, be passionate about what you're doing because you're gonna come up against challenges, you know, you're gonna come up against setbacks. And if you're not truly passionate about what you're doing, like at some point, one of those setbacks and one of those hurdles will stop you because you're not gonna, you're not gonna be willing to persevere. And, um, you know, something I picked up from, um, you know, Arsene Wenger just in an interview he gave, but it's one of the best interviews that I, you know, I would say to any young, professional or young entrepreneur he's asked you know how, how how do you how did how does a young player come through at arsenal you know like actually come through and into the first team or in any club major club and he just simply says it's the willingness to persevere which is ultimately the difference between being successful and not being successful so when you get that setback just simply how many times are you willing to persevere beyond the opponent, beyond the competition, beyond a peer, whatever it is, like if you're willing to persevere, like that is fundamentally gonna be the difference. And so the way that I see that is like perseverance is di directly linked to the level of passion from an entrepreneurial perspective that you have for what you're doing. Yeah. Fabulous. And I'll just say a couple of things. But one question for you, Thomas. I know we speak all the time, but I've known you for probably about three years, mm. and you're probably one, one, one of the most humble people I've sort of met, and, grat and you've got gratitude and you're content. But you sort of underplay yourself, like in terms of the story, like you sort of, you went to Arsenal, and they said, you know, you're too small, you can't play football, and they released you. You went to Reading. You, uh, they wanted you to be the youngest player uh, to play in the first team, then you had your injury. Mm. The doctor said you couldn't even walk, let alone play football, mm. but then you bounced back from that. Mm. Then you became an international. And so you just kept on going. And while you were still playing, you started this business as well. Mm. What, what keeps you just going? You never stop, do you? You just, you just keep going and going. Mm. So is that sort of something in your mindset or is it something you've learned to do? Sort of, you, if someone says to you, you can't do that, you just do it, don't you? Mm. I don't know if that's a good way of putting it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I think if, you know, if it's just been, if I want to do something, yeah. you know, it's a decision mm. for me that I want to do it, yeah. you know? So it's like, um, you know, I'm, I'm, and again, some people are, I think Britain and cultures, etc. like sometimes you're, um, you know, there's an element of um, not pride, but there's almost like a shyness to being selfish. You know, like if you want something, go and get it. Yeah. You know, like it's as simple as that. Like you might have to do something, you know, above and beyond the norm. You know, we said that there, there again, David, like what is your, you know, what do you, how do you have that unique ability? Like you might have to go and above and beyond that to actually achieve it. So just go and do it, like, and, and be willing to make it happen. Yeah. yeah. So and, glad and that was me. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just just one, one other thing I was also going to sort of say is, like I said, you've had these setbacks. So if someone was looking from the outside and they didn't mm. know you, they would think, you know, international player, played in the Premier League, mm. done everything else. But you've had all these setbacks, mm. but you've just managed to overcome them all the time, haven't mm. you? Mm. What keeps you going all the time then? What? Yeah, just been, you know, sort of as I kind of said before, like it's just been like content with what my journey is um, and being willing to, you know, sort of live in my own unique space you know and I would be doing it if I was working for Barclays I'd be exactly the same you know I'd, if, if I, I want to do this it's my decision you know and so this is my decision and um, you know I want to give I want to give my best um, and my best the way that I see it is being impeccable with my actions and it's not about perfection because when something is perfect it can't grow anymore and the only time when that happens you know if you can't grow anymore you ultimately die you know, so it's not never about perfection, it's about, you know, uh, impeccability, which is key. So that's sort of just my psyche, the way that I've programmed my mind. We all are actually in control of our minds, you know, so yeah, that's it. 
Chelsea. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear a word of that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, what are your heroes in life? What do you look up to? Well, heroes in life, so, you know, great one. I think just anyone, anyone inspirational, and I, I take, like, massive inspiration from, like, people who aren't the everyday heroes, if that makes sense, you know? So the mum, single mum, gets up, you know, like, and you see it, a lot, of, a lot of athletes have gone through that journey where they've lived in single-parent homes and their mum has done everything for them, or maybe it's their dad, and they've had to go through that challenge, but they've had that backbone and that support, like, that's a true hero. Like, so for me, it's like, of course, there's, you know, Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, like all of these, like, amazing people in the world who have affect, you know, positively impacted generational change, you know, it's, you know, obviously, Martin Luther, all of these guys that are just insane, but actually, for me, it's the people who, make change in the small areas on a day-to-day -day basis like so yeah i think um and being aware of that as well and i think also yeah it sort of changes your view on life a little bit when you sort of have that mindset like where you know there are heroes in work and there's here you you've passed heroes today you know you've yeah. sat next to heroes like you don't you probably just don't even know it you know like you don't know what they've gone through what they're experiencing and yet they turn up and they're being impeccable with their actions because they, you know, are doing it, you know, for their loved ones or doing it for themselves. So yeah, I think um, that's my sort of view on that. Yeah, I, I, I love the expression not all heroes wear capes, and that's exactly that point, mm -hmm. right? There are heroes out there everywhere, but yeah, I love that. I think there were two pushing yeah. at the back. Oh God, you're not going to leave it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, Spoken about manifest living to get to where you wanted to be, um, and as well that um, actions are equally as important. So I wanted to find out when you were 18 or 19, when you were in the 40s, the professional world, like what was the most, what would you say was the most important thing that you focused on to get to, to where you wanted to be? Mm, yeah, it's a really good question. I would, I would genuinely tell, say, um, <clears throat> I would advise you to read a book called Psycho Cybernetics. Um, from an author called Maxwell Maltz. And that book like, was a cornerstone in my personal thinking. And I'm not saying that my personal thinking is right or wrong, but that's when we look at you know, how, to, how to understand how your mind actually works. Like, it's a really, really powerful book. And I would say, to your point, it's, um, you know, that, that really helped me realize that if what I'm thinking about, you know, I'm setting a destination, you know, so it's like a lot of people, as I said, if they're living in the gap, living in lack, they're actually setting a destination for themselves. They just don't realise they're doing it. And ultimately, as they begin to, you know, trigger those emotions that are at that future event, they're drawing that event towards them. So that is the way that that is the way it works like it's as simple as that like genuinely and if you speak to anyone who's really done anything like incredible and like created something out of the blue like that is how you truly do it and so my point is is like that's the lack and the the gap if you flip that model and actually set that event at a future self of where you're achieving your dreams you know you're manifesting what you want to manifest you're experiencing what you want to experience and then you're assigning an emotional signature to that, almost like you're living that person now. Like, if you stay in that for long enough, like, that's how you begin to manifest. So, yeah, I would say that's a really powerful tool, which I've learned over time, and I think, you know, you'd find valuable. Right. I think this is the last one, yeah. I promise. Mm -hmm. No way. OK. Yeah, good night. One question, so I just wanted to ask, if you could go back in time today to um, the beginning of your entrepreneurial journey, what one piece of advice would you give yourself? Um, I would say it, it's difficult. I think, again, advice is difficult when I look at it from that perspective because you have to experience what you're experiencing. So you can't, like, it's not, you would never, you know, I would never try and change the experience that I've had because that's what's sort of formed me. 
and that's the same you know for you for every, everyone here like you need to really understand that where you're living at this moment in time is where you're meant to be and the quicker you realize that the quicker you can then begin to look at okay well where do I now want to take myself you know so it's like and it's about empowerment you know because again you then begin to realize that you are the master of your destiny you know and whatever that is you know it might be living a completely content life chilled on the sofa you know Saturday nights like that's amazing that's an amazing life right so but and everyone's got a different journey and a different path and a different you know unique ability so I think realizing that is is quite cool yeah, right. Thank you. I think I think he deserves a rest. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I could, um, if only I could bottle bottle some of that insight. I think we captured it, so I'll be playing that to my kids slowly. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, look, that level of humility. I think we. I know. I know you're coming for another event later with uh, and Narendra and the yeah. corporate team but I think we'll sign you up as well to do some more stuff. I think that was phenomenal. So thank you. I think we're going to go to Natalie. Do I need to come down? No, you can do it from there. Yeah. Um, so thought it would be a very cheeky plug for everyone that doesn't know me. My name's Natalie Ojiva. I work for Barclays, more notably Barclays Eagle Labs. Um, Thomas is actually on our Black Venture Growth Programme. So I thought I would be very cheeky and use this as an opportunity as a plug. So at Eagle Labs, we are there to support the ecosystem for entrepreneurs in the UK. If you're a startup, scale up, if you've got a big idea, it's the place where we want to support you. Um, and essentially, we have a few programs that are diversity specific because we recognize there's more that we can do for certain communities. So we've got a Black Founders Accelerator, which is for early stage businesses, 12 week program for you to develop your business over the 12 weeks and it culminates in a demo day. But the newest thing which I'm really excited about and what Thomas is on is our Black Venture Growth Program. So we recognise that there was more that we could do for growth based businesses and helping them on that journey. So we've launched a 16 week program to support 20 black led uh, growth businesses, including Thomas. So what I wanted to say is if you do want to speak about how we support entrepreneurs, whether that's from an idea stage to a scale up, please come and see me. I would love to speak about how we can speak supporting businesses. And I'll be quiet. That's it. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. And then we're also raising some money for um, charity. I, I sort of uh, got involved with the Arpin Foundation, which obviously Thomas, you know everything about. So I've got a signed um, shirt here from the West Brom, and Thomas has kindly agreed to sign the back of that as well. So we've got John Emerson from Gloss, who kindly agreed to uh, pay £300 for this shirt. So this is the money's going to go towards uh, children with autism. So can you come down and uh, say it back to Tom? <laughs> <laughs> Now needs a new phone as well. Do you want a picture? Shall I stand up? Well done, John. Well done. Yeah, that's great. Save it back. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, okay. So that's the money. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to say a bit about yourself and um, and the company as well. Sure, sure. Uh, my name's John Emerson. I represent um, a company called Gloss. Uh, we specialise in creative and digital brilliance, and we're really proud and we genuinely do feel honoured to be amongst such great minds like you all today. It's been a really inspiration, honestly, listening to you speak, Thomas, and thank you so much for your inspirational words. And I'd like to thank all of you in the audience as well, because it was wonderful talking to you all up there, and I genuinely did feel a connection with everybody that I did speak to. So on behalf of myself and um, the entire Gloss team, I'd like to thank you all for um, having me here, to be honest with you, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Well done. Brilliant. Should we get a picture? Do yeah, a picture? Yeah, picture. And then um, it's all signed at the front. Brilliant. I just need you to sign oh, at the back if you. Yeah, I'll do yeah. that. Yeah. But do you want to take a photo? Yeah. Do you want to take a picture? Do you want to take a picture? Yeah, do yeah. a picture. And uh, there we go. Grab okay. a couple of boy on this as well. Thank you, Vincent. Cheers, Ben. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you for your time as well. Yeah, no pleasure. Pleasure. No, no, that's brilliant. No, thank you. Thank you for the donation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you again for your time. I think that the 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 footballer to boardroom piece is phenomenal because there aren't many stories like that, and I love the 
be centered around yourself and understand your purpose and, and your mindset is, mm -hmm. is all, all important and I'll certainly be buying that book. So thank you. Your humility and honest, your, your authenticity was phenomenal. So thank one you. big last round. And then we'll thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. No, really great no, to meet you. Thank, thank you. you. Really appreciate it.